Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, trends and issues from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening I'm joined by a local property rights activist and anti-Agenda 21 rock star in Rosa Corey, and she's with the Post Sustainability Institute, and we're glad to have her this evening. Rosa, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved in something as exciting as property <laughs> rights activists, activism. Um, I am, uh, grew up a liberal Democrat, and um, my education, I went to UCLA, and uh, I'm a, uh, I was a district branch chief for the California Department of Transportation, expert witness in land use and land valuation. I'm an appraiser, commercial appraiser. And uh, so um, about, uh, I think it was around 2005, I was elected to, uh, to a citizens oversight committee for a huge redevelopment project in my town, Santa Rosa. And uh, when I was serving on that committee, I found that, in fact, it was a fraudulent project. And uh, in bringing the information, you know, sort of innocently to the town, to the city, uh, I found that, you know, they were, they were gunning for me immediately. And that was sort of my wake-up call to uh, the reality of uh, the loss of private property rights uh, in our country. And when I was researching the political and corporate uh, forces behind redevelopment, I found United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development. So, so fraudulent projects? Mm -hmm. I can't believe such a thing would <laughs> exist and people trying to exert power over people who don't know what's going on? Isn't that something? Insanity, <laughs> insanity. And so Agenda 21 is something that some people have heard of, some haven't. Mm -hmm. um, just by using those letters all in a row with those numbers behind them, uh, people assume that that we're going to have tin hats on for the rest of the show. Can you explain to them a little <laughs> bit about what Agenda 21 is, or the primer for people who don't know? Sure. Well, you know, it's not like um, Area 51 or Catch 22. It's a real plan. It was mm -hmm. signed on to in 1992 by the United States and 178 other countries. It was right. a United Nations plan. It's the action plan for sustainable development. It is the plan to inventory and control all land, water, minerals, plants, animals, construction, means of production, education, energy, information, and human beings in the world. Well, see, people might think that that's completely crazy, and mm. if they and if they asked if you made it up and everything else, because it's it's for us crazy people to believe in, they wouldn't expect that you could actually find copies of it on the <laughs> United Nations website, as yeah. an example, backed by the biodiversity study, which says things like agricultural agriculture and humans aren't sustainable. Mm -hmm. We've right. got to get rid of them. You know what's sustainable? I, it, it is a real plan, of course, and it, right. it was signed on to by our country. And it, the thing that is in, really incredible is that it you know it's not something that's way out there like in 1992 it's really it's right now in the San Francisco Bay Area being implemented uh, all over in every town and of course it's all over the country and all over the nation mm -hmm. and right here uh, we see it uh, of course as one Bay Area which right. is the regionalization plan here right and so people don't know what regionalization means and many of them might not know that the nine Bay Area counties are tied in together in what used to be an organization for best practices and sharing amongst those community communities. Mm -hmm. But now these people actually have monetary distribution control and are setting forth a, a plan for changing the lifestyle for 9 million people in the Bay Area who have no idea what's about to hit them, right? It's true. You know, this is, it's an arrogant uh, plan that is, the, the idea of regionalization, of course, here in the United States, we have city, county, state, and federal. Right. And we elect all of those levels of government. Right. That's, you know, the people have representative government. But regional government, regional governance, is, uh, is, un, is unelected boards and commissions that actually make the rules and direct what happens in your city, county, or state. So in this case, it's MTC, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, and ABAG, the Association for Bay Area Governments. Right. These are regional boards right. that are directing, uh, they're going to be directing what's happening here in the Bay Area for 28 years and restricting our land use. And if we think we're unique here in the Bay Area, we're misguided. Oh, absolutely. SCAG in Southern California is mm -hmm. doing the same thing, Southern California Association of Governments or whatever, and it's 
in pockets around the country. There are 500 uh, metropolitan planning organizations in the United States. Right. So this is, it's all over the U.S. And it's, of course, it's around the world. The, the goal really is the EU, uh, the European Union. Um, this is the ultimate, uh, at least at this point, in regional governance. Right, right. And uh, th what they propose this as is that citizens of their own volition, it seems, all got together and said so they want the exact same things, right? <laughs> High density housing, right. near mass transit, they don't want single family homes anymore, everyone wants to move into the big city. Isn't that what you voted for? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is this is what makes people think you've got a tinfoil hat on when you right. start talking about this plan because it's a crazy plan. It's not we're not crazy. The plan itself is right. crazy, and they use um, these these uh, sort of visioning meetings. You know, are actually using a technique that was created by the Rand Corporation in the 1950s and 60s to uh, sort of channelize uh, political thought or, um, you know, people's opinion into uh, a, a predetermined outcome while giving them the impression that it was all their idea. So aren't you smart? You yes. created that plan all on your own, even though it's the identical plan all over the United States. Yeah. Coincidentally, they all want the exact same thing, mm -hmm. which is very freedom limiting for some reason, because yeah. we don't need freedom anymore if the government provides everything. It's outdated. Yeah. Yes. The concept. And, you know, what's unsustainable? Private vehicles, private single family homes, um, you know, uh, meat eating that goes over real big in Texas, I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Tillage, livestock, right. air conditioning, appliances. Right. These are considered to be unsustainable right. according to this plan. Right, right. And so uh, how did you get in, involved in actually not just being ticked off, but your face shows up all over YouTube in various mm -hmm. places. You've written a book yeah. uh, about that, and you can tell us a little bit about the book. Oh. Well, let me show you the book. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, this is it. It's uh, Behind the Green Mask, UN Agenda 21. And uh, it's a real short book, and it's about uh, the, uh, the implementation of Agenda 21 locally, because it's a global plan, but it's implemented locally. Right. And um, I, I started giving speeches about, uh, about Agenda 21, and now I'm going around the world and giving these speeches. Right. And uh, people are eager to get this information and to also to understand that this is not a conservative or, uh, you know, pro point of view. Right. I happen to be a liberal Democrat. Right. But well, they're going to throw you out for, for, for doing that. It's not <laughs> oh, yeah. No, they hate me. <laughs> yeah. But, I, you know, I'm going around speaking to tea parties, libertarian groups, Republican groups all over the country. Right. And, uh, of course, I have spoken at some universities. And, you know, it's difficult to hear this when you're progressive because it, it, counter, it, it sort of contradicts your entire worldview. Right. You know, because the educational system has indoctrinated mm -hmm. uh, children uh, all the way up through to postgraduate school in yes. uh, sustainable development principles. And and unfortunately, you talk about the indoctrination. I recently had an opportunity to speak to uh, some master's students in urban planning at mm. UC Berkeley. And I think but that I've, was fun. <laughs> I, well, they had no idea that people had an opposing view. Mm. And, and they come at it from the perspective they are trying to help the planet. And they believe, because this is what they've been told all throughout life, that this is really good for society. And yeah. everybody really wants this. Um, and so when you contradict them, especially on concepts like the inability for government to truly make people equal, I think I mentally scarred some of them for life. They'll <laughs> never be the same. But, yeah. but it's important that they see these other views. And mm -hmm. uh, curiously, uh, I, I'm wondering what your your experience has been outside the country. How much more or less aware are people of Agenda 21 outside the United States? You know, that's an interesting question, Chris, because I was interviewed on uh, Red Ice Radio, which is uh, in uh, Scandinavia. And uh, they kind of thought that ICLE, the International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives, and Agenda 21 were United States issues. And, uh, and that was very interesting because, of course, it is global. It's all right. over in every country. Right. And uh, most every country has a local Agenda 21 uh, guideline and program. Right. Uh, so that, uh, I think what's happening now, though, is that awareness is really... Uh, coming to the fore because awareness is the first step in the resistance. Sure, sure. And even people are, are shocked to know even some of the electeds who are not elected to this regional governance committee but who have been assigned to it, 
it's interesting that many of the players, like, for example, they're going through public input sessions right now, and it's a whole new set of representatives that are coming through, many of which have no idea of what the plan is about, where it originated, that it's been going since the 90s, that the ABAG website actually has documentation about them signing on to this 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have no idea what's going on, and they weren't involved in the initial public input sessions, which literally had 2,000 mostly angry citizens from across the political spectrum saying, this is not what we want. This is, we don't feel like we're heard. Mm -hmm. You're ignoring the citizens. Yeah. But these guys all have fresh smiles on because they don't know any better. Well, I think they do know better. But the deal is that, of course, they, you know, these plants are set up to use the Delphi technique to, uh, you know, to actually channel and propagandize the public right. into the, uh, the outcome that is desired by this plant. So, People who are serving, you know, our local uh, officials are being, um, you know, propagandized by their own staff. Right. And the staff, of course, is being propagandized by the American Planning Association, which put out a 12-week-long boot camp about uh, how to handle people like me and you who are telling the <laughs> truth about these plants. Yes. So when you get that kind of, you know, I mean, that's so great to catch them and things like that. I actually became a member of the American Planning Association so that I could get that information. I was but. at their national conference two weeks ago on behalf uh -huh. of a client, okay. um, but I was there for uh, for four days of fun in the belly. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's upsetting, really, to be right up close and looking down into that cauldron, you know, right. because uh, there this is really an indoctrination plan, and it, it's really about taking away your individual freedom, right. your right to uh, have and own and use your private property. And our nation is founded on private property ownership and we are losing our freedom. And so you've talked about the fact that some of these electeds are being propagandized and everything else. We've just, as of this week, finished the public input sessions, and many people feel like they were ignored mm -hmm. during the session. Um, some of us went to directly poke the uh, observers in the eye and let them know what we mm -hmm. really thought about the plan and, and use actual documentation that they've put out to explain why this is a horrible idea. Mm -hmm. But we've got 9 million people whose lives are about to be affected. Probably less than 1,000 came out because they didn't know what was going on. What now? What now? How can, how can we continue <clears throat> to fight this? What are, the what are the next steps as you see them? Well, right, uh, we have just finished up the public hearing process for one Bay Area. And uh, so the next thing now is that we are going to sue. We are suing to stop one Bay Area, Plan Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And uh, by we, I mean the Post Sustainability Institute and Freedom Advocates. And uh, we are raising funds right now to sue to stop this. And we are fundraising all over the United States because the plan that we have here in the San Francisco Bay Area is literally the worst plan I have seen all across the nation. And these plans are everywhere. But this one in particular is the worst because it actually restricts development to a very, very small part of the Bay Area, very, very tiny areas right. within urbanized areas. And literally, 80% of residential development and 66% of uh, commercial development has to be in these areas for the next 28 years. The only way to stop this now is with a lawsuit, and that is why we are out there trying to, right. you know, trying to get people on board to assist in working on that. And these things are called priority priority development areas, mm -hmm. right? And so. For people who don't know that their land is inside a priority development area, they may lose the privilege to use their property in the ways that they want to. For example, if they're not, um, if they're not building mixed-use housing mm -hmm. or are out of compliance with these other directives, then they're not going to be able to use their property in the way they'd like to. And if people are outside the, the area, then they're not going to be able to use their property either. It, you know, if you're in the county, if you're in an unincorporated town in the county, or if you're just out in the county, literally this plan says that 100 percent of development has to be within the urbanized areas. So they're effectively taking, basically taking conservation easements over the entire county areas in the San Francisco Bay without paying for them. Right. And literally you will not be able to build in the county areas. And so talk to me a little bit about the basis for your lawsuit. I know many people have tried to figure out we need to sue these um, sons of people who are, uh, <laughs> are, are, are not happy beings. But the, the, um, the, the other 
thing is they haven't been able to figure out how to go about it. I mean, I've talked to people who are interested in doing it because maybe there wasn't proper public notice. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some other flaw. Maybe going after the decepti deception that they used within uh, the Delphi techniques that they used. For example, and people don't necessarily understand what that means, that they had paid stakeholders in the room or people who were going to benefit sure. that were voting on the plan for the outcome that they wanted. And they would show up in multiple places, mm -hmm. as if they were concerned citizens. Yeah, which is completely deceptive. Mm -hmm. And they were steering people, and, and yeah, that's standard operating procedure all across the nation. Uh, this is a you know Agenda 21 is about empowering non-governmental organizations and regional boards, so that and these are not elected by us. So right. that's that's kind of how they get around it. The way to fight, you know, what the plan is really is the violation of the California Constitution and the United States Constitution, okay. the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. It violates urban growth boundaries, which were voted on by the voters. Uh, aside from, you know, maybe technical issues that you might find, these are specific issues that, we're, that we will be using as our grounds for our lawsuit. So talk to us a little bit more in detail about what that means. How are these uh, federal and state level constitutions being violated in your estimation? Mm -hmm. Well, you'll see the Fifth Amendment of the, con of the United States Constitution violated because they're taking, uh, they'll be taking your rights without paying you for them. That's a violation of just compensation. Um, the 14th Amendment is equal protection under the law, and that's being violated because if you're not in a priority development area, uh, you know, the people in priority development areas, property owners, will be getting property uh, permits, permits to develop 80 times more than those who are outside. So that's a huge, huge, unfair and unequal uh, application of the law. Right. And then, of course, we have pages and pages of objections that we're writing now to this, uh, to this plan so that we can make sure that we cover everything and exhaust our administrative remedies when we get to court, before okay. we get to court. Great. And so on the, on the state level, uh, what are we looking at as far well, as violations? Well, you know, the state... Constitution is great because it actually says not you know the United States Constitution says that you have the right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness the United the California Constitution says that you have life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and the enjoyment of your property enjoyment and use of your property and so that is written right into our Constitution and this plan violates clearly the opportunity that you have to use your property and this is regardless of whether it's fully developed if you want to you know knock out a wall and add on something this plan is literally going to restrict you from doing that right so this and we're talking about a 28 year long plan right which they say, of course, is going to be reevaluated re evaluated every four years. So it's really, a don't living worry document. about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a living document. <laughs> don't worry scary. about it. Hey, I don't know about you, but living documents are pretty scary because when you think you've got something nailed down, imagine trying, you know, when you've got a business and you want to, you don't have a four-year plan. You've got a 20-year plan. And right. here you go with this thing that you don't know where you are when you right. go for a loan on your well, property. And, and that's the thing, right? Let's say your loan was a living document and yeah. every year they decided to reevaluate how much you're going to be charged. It doesn't make any sense. No. No. whatsoever. Well, if it's kind of a, a done, you know, the way that I think about it is if you're looking at something that doesn't make any sense, it's probably Agenda 21. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I recently um, uh, presented some logic questions for people to assess, and, um, and, I, and I mocked Agenda 21 in those, and they said, well, what is this, Agenda 21 or Common Core, these logic questions? I yeah. said, no, it's neither of them. I, I mean, I, obviously, there is no logic involved in either uh, Agenda yeah. 21 or in Common Core types of curriculum because we're mm -hmm. just being pushed down, like you said, a progressive path where uh, people just uh, really have no clue. You know, Common Core is Agenda 21 right. because globalization is the standardization of all systems. Right. And Common Core is standardization of education. Yes. Uh, we all have to be equal in the collective. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's uh, that's right. Uh, yeah. You know, I said I was a liberal Democrat, but I am not a progressive. Well, and see, and that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice distinction to make. And mm -hmm. a lot of times people don't know the history mm -hmm. because the terms are used sometimes interchangeably. And so uh, the, the question is, um, are, are you uh, somebody who's completely against mass transit and high density housing and um, green spaces? Well, you know, I'm like uh, everybody. I've got a bike. I like to ride it. Uh, I think uh, mass transit is great. 
Um, if you want to build a high density building with uh, ground floor retail and apartments on top of it, great, but don't use my tax dollars to do it. Right. And this is the difference, is that your property tax and your transportation tax dollars will be used to subsidize to, uh, property uh, types, smart growth, for which there is no demand. Right. And they actually literally restrict development all around that, everywhere else, so that mm -hmm. pretty much if you want to build anything, you're going to build what you're told to build right. by MTC and ABAG and right. by extension Agenda 21. Right. And um, it, it, there's no basis in reality whatsoever. Well, there's no demand. If there right. were, then they wouldn't need subsidies. Well, and, and they're looking at, at trying to justify, in some cases, transportation investments as an example that they've already made that make no sense based on the density of the Bay Area mm -hmm. to have implemented in the first place. You know, that's, that is the philosophy behind this, is that if you don't have enough people using trans public transportation, let's pack them all into, you know, these areas right near the stations. Yes. And, you know, the train stations, and then we'll have people using transit. But this is, you know, this is also part of controlling, inventorying, and monitoring, surveilling all all the populations and right. this is the plan. And so tell us uh, how people can find out more about supporting the lawsuit or how to find out more information about your book. Great. Or you. Well, or me. Um, well, of course there are a lot of uh, videos of me on YouTube and speaking about these issues and um, and as well uh, you can find my book Behind the Green Mask UN Agenda 21 on Amazon on our websites uh, Democrats Against UN Agenda 21 right. Com and also postsustainabilityinstitute.org. Well, Rosa, we appreciate you joining us this evening. We look forward to following what you're doing and also being right by your side, poking people in the eye. So Great. thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you. And at this point, if you hold on for just a moment, we'll be back after a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. constitutional law attorney. And they say, oh really, what kind of constitutional law attorney? I say, well, I'm the kind of the true kind. The kind of believe that the Constitution is what the Constitution says and what it was intended to say. Anything beyond that is tyranny and should not be allowed. Um, so. so it's come to this, my friends. You're ready for the second American Revolution against a ruling class that simply lectures but does not listen or defend the American people. It is government versus the people. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Look at the Electoral College example. Right? A leftist popular challenge to states' rights. You think the founders were brilliant people? Did they not know what they were doing by carefully calibrating to get the small states and the big states to come together? Why does Wyoming get two senators in California? Actually, I'd rather have Wyoming's two senators. <laughs> And welcome back to The Right Side. That was a message from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum, who we appreciate tremendously for helping to make sure that the show can be brought to you. 
But the thing that they're best known for is their speaker series. And so uh, just to share a few of the speakers that are in the coming lineup, this evening, Bill Whittle will be speaking at the Conservative Forum. And that's held at 432 Stierlin Road, just three minutes from here in Mountain View at the IFES Portuguese Hall. Typically, it starts at 7 o'clock and doors open slightly before then. But in June, uh, on the 4th, Ying Ma, author of The Chinese Girl in the Ghetto, will be a guest on July 9th, which is the second Tuesday as opposed to the normal first Tuesday of the month. Debbie Bacigalupi, who's a recent candidate for Congress and a recent uh, guest on the show, will be there. On August 6th, Steve Forbes and Elizabeth Arms uh, will be talking about their new book, The Freedom Manifesto, and yes, it is that Steve Forbes. On September 3rd, Elizabeth Nick, uh, Nixon will be talking about her book, Ecofascism. But in closing tonight, I wanted to share a little bit of the logic that I uh, hinted at during the show that doesn't exist within the One Bay Area plan. I posed a few questions uh, for some of my Facebook friends. And the first one was One Bay Area logic question of the day number one. If high density housing is more affordable, why isn't rent $300 a month in San Francisco or in Manhattan, as an example? Bay Area, one Bay Area logic question number two. Let's say, hypothetically, 400 people live in human kennels. Those are 200 square foot apartments, for those of you who don't know. And they're living over a retail space that's designed to provide them with walkable jobs where they live. If the sign in the window says Starbucks, part-time jobs are created for 20 of those kennel dwellers, and the local tattoo artist and body piercing engineer picks up about 10 extra hours of work per week. How many walkable jobs are created if the sign in the window says, for lease? Logic question number three. If John used to kiss his family goodbye in the morning and use his car to commute 20 minutes each way to work, um, and now, out of fairness to the collective and to comply with the One Bay Area goal for him to walk 70% more per day for transportation and use mass transit, he's changed the way he commutes. His commute's now 60 minutes unless there are delays. How much extra time has One Bay Area allowed him to spend with his family and thereby improving his quality of life? Now, the reality is I'm not against public transportation, apartment dwellers, I've been one, uh, tattoos or body piercings because I've had one tattoo, four earrings, and a body piercing I did at home myself. I'm not against these things, but what I am against is a central planning organization dictating to me and nine, other million, nine million other people their version of utopia, and these people have no idea what's about to hit them. So what I'm suggesting is that you learn more about the One Bay Area Plan and then join me, Rosa Quarry, and other countless activists in this fight for your liberty and to protect the Bay Area we all call home and love. I've been your host, Chris Pareja, and this has been The Right Side. We'll see you again soon.